All right, Isaiah chapter 11, kind of a fun chapter to preach through for me just because it's, uh, hopefully it's fun for you to listen to and, and study because this is a lot of prophecy here in Isaiah chapter 11. It's all about Jesus Christ again. And, you know, the book of Isaiah is just chock full of, of prophecies about Jesus, about his first coming, about his second coming. And um, it's just it's just amazing how much is here. And as we study this too, it's just, it's just another... Um, you know, glory to God, proof of, of the Bible being the Word of God, in, in a sense, uh, you know, I was thinking about this last week, or earlier this week, I forget exactly when the thought came to me, but it's not the first time it's come to me, it's come to me in the past too, when you, when you read the Bible, and you study the Bible, and you think about these things, and you read, and you see the connections, and we're going to see a lot of connections between this evening, specifically with the book of Revelation, and Isaiah chapter 11, and this is just one place, just, just these two places in the scripture, how, how, how perfectly they fit together. And, and in a sense, it's obvious, but at, at, when you're reading it, it just makes perfect sense on its own also. And, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is this, you know, with, with God's word having multiple author, authors, it's written in such a fluid way that these connections aren't forced. They're not contrived. It's not something that was done after the fact. Because people would like this to try to disprove Bible prophecies and things by saying like, oh, well, I mean, yeah, well, they read the Old Testament and then they just wrote something to try to make it match, right? So they try to come up and, you know, some people will even say that Jesus Christ himself was fictitious, that he never really existed. And it's all just this story about people who believe this religion wanted to make up so they made up all these stories about this person and wrote it, in a, you know, and tried to make it look like this savior that was prophesied came. And, and it's a bunch of, that's a bunch of nonsense for, for many reasons. I mean, that's, that's pretty ridiculous. It's pretty well documented that Jesus Christ is a real person. I mean, the fact that we even have our time dated from the birth of Jesus Christ is, is a testimony to how influential and important he was on the world as a world figure that it cannot, is not just someone who was made up, right? I mean, that, that alone is just one huge thing. But people will say these types of things and say, oh, you're just looking at this. But these, the way the Bible fits together is, is just completely amazing. And again, what, We'll see, um, you know, when you, when you, like I said, when you read through the book of Revelation, it all just flows. When you read through Isaiah, it flows. But then you start seeing, like, wow, they're talking about the same exact thing here. And sometimes they might be using slightly different words, but it's, it's close enough where you can see that is definitely talking about the same things. And we're going to see that in a minute from verse 2 with the Spirit of the Lord. Um, well, let's, just, let's get started here in verse number 1. I won't get too far ahead of myself, but... As you start to see these connections, it's just like, yeah, there's no way that some man was able to write such a good sounding book like Revelation and include all of these things to just support it with that, that you're just thinking about that and being able to write in a way to incorporate all of these different things. And especially with other chapters of Isaiah and include all of that in just, just two books, just Revelation and Isaiah. But then also looking at the Gospels, also looking at other prophets, also, you know, it's incredible how well everything just fits together. And it's just a testament to the holy word of God that it actually comes from God because it is perfect. Because no human authors could, could contrive such a, a work of perfection. Just impossible. Just impossible. There's too much here. There's too much that, that you know, the most brilliant author alone can do it, let alone a whole bunch of authors spanned over time and even in geographic locations um, coming up with things that work so well per perfectly together. But let's get, let's jump in here. Verse number one. The Bible says, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And, and keep a finger here and turn to Revelation and keep a finger in Revelation. Also, we're going to flip back and forth for multiple places here. Revelation 22, so the last, the last chapter of the Bible. And we see this, this, these terms actually used 
a few times in Scripture about Jesus. And just from verse number one, this is obviously talking about Jesus being the rod out of the stem of Jesse. Jesse was David's father. And, uh, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Roots, excuse me. Verse 16 of Revelation 22, the Bible says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So Jesus Christ himself is just saying in Revelation 22, hey, I, Jesus, I am the root and the offspring. And, and that alone is just amazing, showing that he is God. Like, how could he be the root and the offspring? And that's what Jesus was trying to confound the Pharisees with. Well, if David saith in spirit, my Lord said unto my Lord, how can, how can he be the son of David then, if he's his Lord? Right? Well, because he's God. That's how he's the root and the offspring. That's how he could be at both ends of the genealogy, right? Because physically, he comes from the line of David when he was physically born and thrilled. But when it comes to the creation of mankind, he created man all the way going back to Adam, right? So um, that's how he's the root and the offspring of David. And of course, Isaiah 11, 1 says, is basically saying the same thing. There's a rod that's going to come forth out of the stem of Jesse, which is the root, and, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. But it's still coming out of Jesse, which is coming out of David, which is going through that, that same line unto the, the birth of Christ. Verse 2 is continuing to talk about this same person in Isaiah 11. Um, keep your place in Revelation also. Go back to Isaiah 11, verse 2. The Bible says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. All these things, the Bible says, these spirits are going to be on Jesus when he comes. And look at Revelation chapter 3, verse number 1. Because what you might have noticed there is that the Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord, in verse number 2 of Isaiah 11, if you count all those up, you're going to find seven spirits. The Spirit of the Lord is one. The Spirit of wisdom is two. The Spirit of understanding is three. The Spirit of counsel is four. The Spirit of might is five. The Spirit of knowledge. And then the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. Those are seven spirits brought up about Jesus Christ uh, having those seven spirits. Revelation 3, verse number 1, the Bible says, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. So again, this is Jesus Christ himself speaking as he's speaking to these churches and giving the messenger, you know, giving the, the angels their, their charge for each of these churches. He's saying, I am he that hath the seven spirits of God. Flip over to Revelation chapter 5. And we're going to see another reference to the seven spirits of God. In verse number 6, the Bible says, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth in all the earth. So the lamb has the seven spirits of God. And again, this, and, and what, what I'm saying about this all being so amazing is that Isaiah is really cryptic in the way that it's written. Ca talking about a stem and the, the spirits and, and uh, you know, the fact that, that he's going to have the spirit of the Lord and the spirit of wisdom and understanding. And then it's spelled out much more clearly in Revelation 3 and Revelation 5. Like, no, this is Jesus. I have the seven spirits of God. I have, you know, the lamb has the seven spirits of God. And it just becomes so abundantly clear of what's being spoken. Go back to Isaiah chapter 11. Keep a place in Revelation. We're going to be going back there in just a minute. But also what's interesting about this too, because this is foreshadowing the, uh, the reign of Jesus Christ. And, and one of the things that's, um, I guess, emphasized about Christ, apart from him being the Savior, which is the most important thing, and that's, that's what's emphasized most, but his second coming revolves around him being the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and the Prince of Peace and, and ruling and reigning and, you know, and, and sitting on the throne in judgment and in righteousness and in mercy and all these things. Uh, that's, that's another main theme of the, coming of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And just as we saw in Isaiah chapter 9, remember we went through all the attributes 
and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, right? The Everlasting Father, all of those things. And I, and I went through and taught how all of those attributes are relating to someone who would be a ruler or a king. Every single one of those fit that perfectly. Well, we see the same thing with the spirits of uh, the seven spirits that he has too. the spirit of the Lord being upon him. You see people getting the spirit of the Lord. No, not just Jesus, but getting the spirit of the Lord. The spirit of the Lord came upon Samson. The spirit of the Lord came upon this person and that person. They do these great mighty things, right? They do mighty acts. They're endued with power from on high to do great acts. That's the spirit of the Lord coming upon him. It says resting upon him. The spirit of wisdom. Obviously, we went over that. Uh, in, Revel in Isaiah chapter 9, wisdom and understanding is extremely important for someone who's going to be a judge and ruling over people to have. Counsel as well, just giving good advice. And might, being a mighty ruler, a mighty uh, um, person to, to be as a king. The spirit of knowledge, you know, knowledge, wisdom, understanding, counsel, all of these things are so tightly close together. And then, of course, the fear of the Lord. And, and a king can be very smart and have wisdom, and have knowledge, and if they don't have the fear of the Lord, you know, they're going to fail. So these things are all very important in having the fear of the Lord, because you're going to, you need to lead in righteousness. So, um, I just, uh, it's interesting seeing these prophecies, and, and what the Bible is specifically talking about when referring to Christ, and referring to his second coming, and as we continue on here in Isaiah 11, we're going to see a picture of the millennial reign of Christ. That's what's going to end up being prophesied here in this chapter. This isn't the, the first coming. This is the second coming. Look at verse number three. The Bible says, And he shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. So when Jesus judges, it's not just going to be you know, what's on the surface, right? He doesn't just, just make quick judgments, just, just, well, how do things appear? He gets to the, to the heart of the matter. He goes deeper than just what's on the surface. Well, what do you see with your eyes? Or what do you hear with your ears? He judges righteously. He says, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor. It, you have to dig deeper. If you're going to be a righteous judge in any, in any matter, if we're going to be righteous judges, Right? We ought to judge things righteously. Everybody judges. Now, some people are in positions to actually have impact over others when they judge, and, and most people don't necessarily, but you still want to be a righteous judge in all that you do, just as much as you would expect a judge sitting in a judge's seat to be a righteous judge. And in order to judge righteously, you need to not just look at what's on the surface. Now, this is really time. I wasn't even thinking about preaching this tonight. It didn't come up in my notes. But, but how important is this in the time that we live in today with the ability to see screenshots or like quick clip videos of different things and start forming judgments and forming opinions on things without even hearing the whole matter or really knowing all the context or knowing everything that's going on. Look, people manipulate all the time using that. You can see small bits and small pieces. I mean, we're having this happen all the time just in the media with, you know, with all the, and people are rioting over this stuff. You get these little clips of, of, you know, people, you know, cops with their knees on necks or what, you know, dealing with people in, in, a, in a way that that's, looks horrible, right? It's like, man, I can't believe they would do that. But you only see that really small section. But then you start to understand, it's like, Man, this guy was high on drugs, he was combative, he was doing all this stuff, and then you start to realize, you know what, maybe that's not quite the picture that it looked like up front. You know, the narrative that I was told in the context of the situation, now all of a sudden it really doesn't look quite as bad as it was being portrayed to be. Judging unrighteously is just taking the side of that, whoa, yeah, that's just, I mean, you just can't do that or whatever. Understand the context. Dig deeper. Understand what's really going on. And, and you can say that for a, for a host of things. Don't ever, don't ever just, and I don't care who it come from, comes from either. Obviously, you know, some sources are more credible than others. But if you are going to be a righteous judge, don't just be a respecter of persons. Don't form a judgment or opinion until you can get all the facts. And if you can't get all the facts, then reserve judgment. 
It's the wise thing to do. It's prudent. It's going to keep you from getting into problems. Because when you make your judgments too hasty, and then you start speaking out about it, you're going to put your foot in your mouth when you start finding out, oh, well, maybe that wasn't exactly what the, the truth was. Well, but someone else told me. Yeah, you know what, though? But if you start going forward and saying stuff that someone else told you, you get yourself into problems. You, you shouldn't be saying that if you don't know. Don't be repeating matters that other people say. Be careful with that. I mean, it's, a, it's, 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 it's so easy to fall into that trap. It's so easy to fall into that trap. And this is honestly the reason why I take the stands that I do in our church and with different things that I hear going on is because a lot of the time I don't know all the facts on different things when people have problems with other people and things like that. I don't know all the facts. So I'm not going to stand up here and start pronouncing judgments on things that I don't really know all the facts on. I don't know all the context of things. I don't know how everything was said. So I'm going to reserve judgment on that, and I think you ought to as well. And I think that's the wise thing to do. And if at the end of the day there is no bearing on you, then, what, what, then you know what? Leave that off. And if, you're, if you feel compelled that you need to judge on something, then make sure you get all the information. Get all the information, and then make a judgment. And then and, and, and make the and, and make the righteous judgment. This is how Jesus judges. It's not just what he hears with the ear, what he sees with the eye, just just oh, someone said it, so it must be true. Oh, that's what I see. It's on the internet, it must be true, right? No, you're gonna dig deeper, challenge it, test it, try it. Right? The Bible says, try the spirits, whether they be of God, right? You gotta test it. You don't just say, Oh, this person said he was of God. That was the, the big problem that um the man of God that was sent in to preach against Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, right? When he was preaching against the altar, and the altar came down, and he was told to go in. He's, and God says, you know what? Go in there, preach his message, leave, depart, don't have a meal there, don't stop. Just go in this way, and don't even go out the way you came. Go out and leave that place. And what happened? Another man met him in the way. He says, oh, well, I'm a man of God, too. And an angel talked to me, and he said, you need to come over and eat with me. And he didn't challenge that. And it actually contradicted the word of the Lord that he got from the Lord. And it cost him his life. Major problem there. I mean, that, that's huge. You say, but all he did was go back. He disobeyed the word of the Lord that he received from God. And just trusted in someone else that lied to him. A liar. Probably just because he was hungry. He was like, yeah, meal sounds good right about now. And you just give in to that. Oh, you said it's from God. Okay, great. No. Look. Stay true to the word of the Lord. And then, and then you know, don't just accept everything that you hear. With righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips. Shall he slay the wicked, and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. So now we're seeing, what we're seeing a picture of here in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 3 through 5, is Jesus Christ coming to set up his kingdom in righteousness. Because things have been wrong up to this point, but you know what? He's going to come and he's going to be a righteous judge, and he's going to have the right spirits of God. He's going to come and set up his throne. He's going to judge the poor. He's going to reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, right? The meek shall inherit the earth, the Bible says. And Jesus is going to make sure that the meek inherit the earth when he comes and sets up his kingdom, because right now the meek aren't inheriting the earth, like as of right now. Now they do inherit the earth when Jesus comes back. But then it says he's going to smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. So there's judgment coming against the evildoer. And that also happens when Jesus comes and, you know, in preparation to set up his kingdom. Look at Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. We're going to see this when he comes on the white horse. Jesus Christ comes on the white horse. We see these events playing out that we were reading about in Isaiah chapter 11. And, and, and I've put in bold specific words in my notes here in these verses because you see these same things that were in Isaiah 11, like righteousness. Righteousness, he's judging the poor, and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins. 
And it says, faithfulness is the girdle of his reins. Look at it, uh, Revelation 19, verse 11. The Bible says, and I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Well, judging and making war, isn't that the exact context that we saw in Isaiah chapter 11? Judging and then making war and destroying people with, with his mouth. Verse 12, his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Obviously, this is Jesus Christ. In the beginning, it was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And uh, in John chapter 1, it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And, and, you know, the Word being made flesh dwelling among us is Jesus Christ, the only begotten of the Father. Word of God. This is Jesus Christ. Revelation 19, verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. Doesn't that sound familiar to what we saw in Isaiah chapter 11, where it says, He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Revelation 19, 15 which it says there, the rod of his mouth in, in uh, Isaiah 11, 4. And he drew him with the rod of iron, and he treaded the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. That's in Revelation 19. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 11, because if you continue reading in chapter 19, if you continue reading there in context, then he sets up his millennial reign, where, where he rules and reigns for a thousand years because he's casting the beast and the false prophet into the lake of fire and, and gets rid of them for that whole, or he casts Satan into the lake of fire where the, uh, where the beast and the false prophet already are. And then he rules and reigns for a thousand years on this earth before Satan is loosed again. And we're going to get to that too, because Isaiah 11, I think, is talking about that as well. Isaiah 11, I believe, encompasses the entire reign of Christ on this earth. Uh, verse number 6, now back in Isaiah chapter 11, because what happens during the millennial reign of Christ is there's this great time of peace. And in a minute, we're going to go back to Isaiah chapter 2, because we read about this in Isaiah chapter 2 as well. It, it lines up perfectly with what we're reading in chapter 11. But that's, we, if you remember in, um, was it chapter 5 or 7, where they beat their, their swords in the, in, to, in the pruning hooks, right? And, and, and we, we looked at uh, the, the other references for those in... Um, I think it's in Micah or Joel, and, and we've got to see the, the other references, but definitely in Joel. And, and that also symbolized the, uh, the coming time of peace, right? Because there's not gonna, you don't need the weapons anymore because you're going to live in, in peace and prosperity because Jesus Christ will be ruling with a rod of iron, and there's going to be no more war. He's going to bring you know, a thousand years peace on this earth with Jesus Christ at the helm. And on top of that, what we see here in, in Isaiah chapter 11 is that it's more, it, it, it spans more than just human beings and their conflict. It actually goes into the animal world as well, where things kind of revert to the way that they were at the beginning of creation. So until the fall of man and really until, you know, until sin entered into the world, when God created you know, the Garden of Eden, you know, all of the animals, I mean, remember in Genesis, God, you know, all the animals of the earth were created during creation. Land animals, sea animals, you know, all these different creatures were created. But until sin happened, there wasn't, um, like, the violence didn't occur. And there wasn't this, uh, God, there were no carnivores on the earth that, that basically all the creatures, including mankind, was eating of the fruits of the garden or, you know, of, of, of the, the, the land, of, of what the land was producing for them. And it wasn't until after the flood then where all these other things were then opened up and, the, and there was freedom to eat uh, of all these creatures and to slay and eat and do all these other things. And that's also around the time when, when the animals were, you know, became carnivorous as well. But look at verse number six. The Bible says, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, 
Now, right now, a lamb is a meal for a wolf. Right, that would be a nice, tasty meal for that wolf to go devour a lamb in the natural world. They've got those big fangs. They're going to go tear up a lamb, and they're going to love it, and they're going to enjoy it. But when Christ comes to the earth and sets up his reign, God's going to make it so that that doesn't happen anymore. The wolf is going to dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them. So look at all these predators here. A leopard, a wolf, the, um, the, the lion, right? With this prey, and then a little child is just going to be leading all of them. I mean, imagine, I wouldn't keep, let a little child around a wolf or a leopard or a lion for a second. I mean, you, you'd be protecting, like, get in here. Because those are extremely dangerous animals. But how awesome, how awesome is that going to be when Jesus sets up his kingdom here? Because there's going to be all these magnificent animals and these creatures that right now, if we're going to enjoy them, <laughs> we enjoy them when they're locked up behind bars to admire their beauty and the creation that God gave them from safety. But during the millennial reign, we'll truly be able to enjoy all of God's creation without fear or threat of harm. You'll be able to understand what it's like. I just got an email sent out uh, to, to my community about there's been a lot of break-ins and people, you know, going through cars and stuff like that. Not break-ins of houses, but like vehicles and stuff. And, you know, we always lock our doors and, there, you know, people get security cameras and everything else. You don't have to do that during a millennial reign. You leave doors unlocked, you're going to live in safety and prosperity. You're going to be able to do your own work and, and eat of your own vine and eat of, you know, not have everything taxed out of you and be able to just live a great, free, you know, no fear based life during that time of Christ. And, and we're going to get a true taste of what God intended from the beginning. And, and how awesome is that to look forward to? And, you know, when, when you feel beat down and everything just seems dark and gloomy here, you know, think about that millennial reign. That should brighten your day up a little bit and just, just start thinking about that and going like, man, how cool is that going to be? How much you ever want to go up and just pet a tiger and just be like, give them a big hug or something just because they look so soft or, or, or grab hold of a lion's mane, Right. <laughs> But you'd never do that in this world. <laughs> you'd never do that in this life. But you'll be able to it during that millennial reign because they're not going to just devour you. And Satan won't be walking about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Because he's going to be burning in hell for those thousand years. It's going to be great. Verse 7, and the cow and the bear shall feed. You're going to have cows you know, grazing on the, on the grass. And you got bears going and grazing on the grass right next to them. And their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp. An asp is a snake. A sucking child is a, a little baby is going to be able to go, oh, yeah, pick up a, a, a venomous snake. But, but it won't be venomous. It's not going to be striking and attacking and killing a child. It's, they're they're going to be able to play with the asp. And the weaned child shall put his hand and the cockatrice ends. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And, and even that is just amazing. The earth is being full of the knowledge of the Lord. There's how many people today are just ignorant of God's word, ignorant of the Lord, just don't understand anything about God. I mean, just really just have no understanding at all. And there's such a lack of knowledge in the world today. But the knowledge of the Lord is going to be spread abroad across the whole earth. Verse 10, and in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. So it talks about the holy mountain, and again, Referring to Jesus, the root of Jesse, 
which he already, we already saw that in Revelation, that he's the root and the offspring of David. David and Jesse, you know, it's father and son, same family, same, same lineage, same person, essentially, uh, for our purposes here. And go back to Isaiah chapter 2 because we're, we see basically the same picture that we saw, that we're seeing here in Isaiah chapter 2. Look at verse number 2 of Isaiah chapter 2. The Bible reads, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. So this is where we're seeing, you know, the Gentiles shall seek, where Jesus is going to be this ensign unto the people, and the Gentiles are going to seek unto that, meaning, you know, people of the whole world, right? It's not just the people of God, but everyone's going to be seeking unto that wisdom and unto that knowledge. So it says here, the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. Verse three, and many people shall go and say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Okay, it was Isaiah chapter 2. I was saying 5 or 7. Silly me, I just prepared this and forgot already that was chapter 2, but I've been looking at a lot of different things, so forgive me for that infraction. But this is where we see, you know, no war, no nation lifting up sword against another, not learning war, and not learning war is actually important as we get into the rest of this passage here. Right? So for a thousand years, there's going to be peace and prosperity. People aren't going to have weapons. So the Bible teaches that you know, those of us who are in Christ and those of us that suffer with Christ are going to be ruling and reigning with Christ. And the Bible talks about the rewards given in the kingdom of God and you know, those who are being productive and good servants and, and being fruitful and doing the work of the Lord, that God is going to reward them um, in, in, I think, multiple ways. But in one of the ways specifically, it talks about you know, well done, thou good and faithful servant, thou has been, um, you know, faithful in a few things, you know, be thou ruler, over, you know, being ruler over many cities and being ruler over, over um, different, you know, having different status as far as ruling and reigning with Christ. Like, not everyone is going to be ruling to the same degree. Some people are going to be over a lot more than other people. And the reason for that is because there's going to be nations. The world is still going to be populated with a bunch of people, and not everybody's going to be saved during the millennial reign of Christ. There's going to be plenty of unsaved people, and we're going to see that because at the end of the millennial reign, all of the unsaved people, Satan's going to come back, and he's going to deceive the world into fighting against God, this one last battle. And, um, of course, they're not going to win, but that is going to happen and what's interesting about that, too, is just the fact that it's talking about, you know, there's going to be no weapons. So, so think about this. As a ruler, you know, if you're ruling and reigning in a high position, you're still not going to have any weapons. You know, today you think that's kind of strange, right? All rulers and people in high position, they've got, if they don't have it themselves, they're going to have people close to them bearing arms for protection. I mean, it makes sense. <laughs> that's what we do in the world that we're in today. I mean... I'm bearing arms right now <laughs> for protection. Not that I'm worried about it, but like, you know, it's, it's a prudent thing to do in this world that we live in today. But because it's going to be so peaceful, we're not going to need that. You know, and people are going to be even, you know, rulers are going to be able to rule. And Jesus is ruling and reigning with a rod of iron, yet still doesn't need that physical protection of, of, of swords or, or guns or anything like that. Because there's still going to be peace. Because there's, there's law is going to be out there. It's going to be enforced. And we will have confidence knowing that everything's working the way it ought to be, even when people are, are breaking the law and need to be punished and, and those things are, are being dealt with. You, you won't need, it's still going to be peaceful. It's going to be very peaceful. So, and, and I don't even know to what extent people are going to be breaking law. You know, I mean, obviously, it's, I, I would think it's going to happen, but this level of peace is going to be so great that you don't have to worry about the, the you know, losing stuff and having to defend yourself and things like that. So um, obviously there's certain things that we don't have full comprehension of exactly how it's going to be with unsaved people yet still having things run great, but I'm looking forward to it because it sounds good. But 
the fact that they're not going to have these weapons, it's, it's, it actually makes sense for what we're going to read for the rest of this chapter. Let's get started here in Isaiah 11, uh, continuing, verse number 11. We're going to finish off the rest of the chapter, and then we're going to go back. We're going to look at Revelation 20 and then look at Ezekiel. Verse 11, the Bible reads, And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And, and this is talking about various places kind of all, all around, scattered around. He's going to gather them back a second time. So this isn't the first time he gathers all of his people that were scattered abroad. Now this is the second time that he's doing this. And I believe that this is happening at the end of that reign where his people have been scattered abroad because they're ruling and reigning with him. But now he's going to call them back. And look at what it says here in verse 12. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So, I mean, he's calling them from all over the world to come back. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. And this is the, the strife within the house of Israel, right? Ephraim is still a one of the children of Israel and children of God. And, and Judah saying they're going to be unified. Um, that's, the, I think that's the point of this here. But then it says in verse 14, But they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west. They shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their hand upon Edom and Moab. And the children of Ammon shall obey them. And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea. And with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river and shall smite it in the seven streams and make men go over dry shod. Now, this is talking about the Nile River. That's the, it, you know, it, the tongue of the Egyptian Sea. That's, you know, Egypt is in northern Africa, basically. And you, you, um, you've got the Nile River flowing up into the Mediterranean Sea up there. And at the, at the, the delta where it breaks off and goes into the water, you've got these seven streams that come off, that it splits off into. And the Bible saying that God is going to uh, smite it in the seven streams and make men go over dry. So he's going he's to dry that up. He's going to stop that, that flow so that, so that people can cross through there. And not just there, verse 16 says, and there shall be an highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, like as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. Now, we know when they came out of Egypt, what happened? God parted the Red Sea and prepared a way for his people to cross over and to get and to be saved essentially from those that were trying to destroy and kill them. And what I think this is, I think this is, you know, kind of a darker way, uh, you know, of, of putting this, like these things are going to happen that when God calls his people right near the end, it's going to be because when Satan's loosed and he goes to deceive the nations, that they're going to go and then try to, to surround Jerusalem and, and um, destroy. Well, we'll read about it. Turn to Revelation chapter 20 and we'll read about it. But he's going to come and try to destroy them. So I think this is God's way of making that safe passage for his people, just like he made safe passage for his people coming out of Egypt. When Pharaoh was coming with his armies to destroy them, God protected them, and God made that way so they could make it in. You know, we're not going to have uh, these weapons and other means of defending ourselves if people decide to, to come, come forward against you, to kill you, and destroy you. Um, so we're going to go to our hope and our shield and our defender and go to the Lord who is ruling and reigning uh, in a mountain in Jerusalem and is going to protect us. And God makes that way so that we can get there from, from the four corners of the earth, essentially, to be able to get there uh, dry shot and, and be able to make it. Now, look at verse number 7 of Revelation chapter 20, and this is what I think it's talking about. Now, I may be incorrect about this, but this is the way that I see it. I mean, I, I think this is, so far, up to this point, everything's been very clear on, on the prophecy of, of the millennial reign and everything else. 
this just seems to me like it fits perfectly. Revelation 20, look at verse number 7. The Bible says, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog. And again, the four quarters of the earth, he's, you know, deceiving these nations, and God's calling his people out of the four corners of the earth. So, I mean, so you could see how there's, the, again, the same type of language being used with his people coming out as Satan's going out to deceive the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So we know how God's going to destroy them. Right? God's just going to destroy them with his mouth. He's just going to just rain fire and brimstone down on them, and they're done. So it's not much of a battle, right? We don't have much to worry about. But God is still calling his people home because these people are gathering together. And obviously, if they're, if they're you know, in, encompassing the camp round about, that's where all the saints are, are congregating to, to be close to the Lord. Because during the rain, you're ruling and reigning. Well, you're going to be ruling and reigning over all different parts of the world, all over the place. Wherever God has a place for you to, to you know, maybe, maybe if you weren't uh, that great of a, of a Christian, you're going to be ruling and reigning from Siberia or something. I don't know. I mean, you're going to be somewhere else. Yeah, it's going to be peaceful, but like, you're like, man, I wish I would have done a little bit more. I could <laughs> I'll be ruling and reigning, reigning from Hawaii or from, you know, some other really nice place. I don't know. But um, anyway, I mean, who knows what the weather's going to be like, but um, turn if you would to Ezekiel chapter 38, because what's mentioned in Revelation chapter 20 is Gog and Magog. Okay, and Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 is also a reference to Gog. Now, real quickly, when we're reading about, especially in the Old Testament, when you're reading prophecies, they are much more cryptic, and oftentimes, I would say probably even the majority of times, it's mixed in with, like, current events that are about to happen or happening right then and future events. So, especially with Gog and Magog, I believe that there is really a Gog, like, during... Old Testament times that's being prophesied about, but then also referring to this future battle here. And I think Ezekiel 39 probably has more to do with the past than with the future. And Ezekiel 38 has more to do with the future than with the past. But we're going to read this anyway so we can glean based on what, we, what else we know, from, especially from Revelation, from other books of the Bible, uh, uh, on this event that's going to happen after Satan is loosed and deceives the four quarters of the earth. Because... This is mentioned, Gog and Magog is being re mentioned on purpose because the only time that's mentioned in Scripture is in Ezekiel. So it's drawing our attention back to Ezekiel to get more info on this event. Ezekiel 38, verse number 8, the Bible reads, After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste. But it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. I mean, again, this is talking about that rain, a millennial rain. People dwelling safely, everyone's dwelling safely. And in the latter years, they're brought back from the sword, you know, gathered out of many people, which is what, what the, the saints are going to be gathered out of the many people, brought back to Jerusalem. The mountains of Israel, where the Lord's house is going to be. Okay, verse 9. That, and, and this thou is not... Is not um, you know, it's not talking to a good, a good person here. It's just talking to, this is, this is someone doing bad things. Look at, thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud. Uh, you know, because he's talking to like Gog, right? Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. So this is this huge army, this huge force coming against the mountains of Israel, against the saints. Verse 10. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. So, like I said, when it's, when it's a thousand years of peace and prosperity, you're not going to need to be locking your doors. You're not going to have to build gates. You're not going to have to worry about building all these walls because it's going to be a time of, of peace and safety. But this evil thought comes in when Satan goes about to deceive people, going, man, look how easy it is. These suckers, 
you know, they're living carelessly. They're living at ease. We just go and take all their stuff, right? And you know that God has blessed those who will be ruling and reigning with them. Who knows what the rest of the, of the world, especially the unsaved world, what they're going to be doing and, and how much prosperity they're going to have. I don't know. But the devil's going to deceive them into thinking, hey, let's go get their stuff, right? Make them covetous. Make them want to. Like, yeah, yeah, who do they think they are anyway? Let's just go take it. It's going to be real easy. We've got tons of people here. And it also demonstrates, too, how even with Jesus ruling and reigning, there's still going to be a bunch of unsaved people. Because for whatever reason, like, just like when Jesus was on this earth and walking around, people chose to, to reject him and not believe on him. It's going to be the same time during that millennial reign. There's still going to be unsaved people that are still going to, it's like, well, and then, you know, maybe we'll probably, we'll understand more about how that could even be, because as we read scripture now, we know it happened and we, we can see it. It's obvious, but it's, it's harder to fathom that. You know, because I would think, you know, I, I mean, if I saw a guy walking around and doing all these things and preaching the word of God, it's kind of like, why, why wouldn't you believe him? But we'll, we'll understand more during the millennial reign of Christ because it's going to happen again. Because these people are going to end up just, just turning to want to kill God again. And kill the people of God. And it says here, so here's the evil thought. You know, he says, let's go up to these unwalled villages. These people are not protected. Verse 12, to take a spoil and to take a prey to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof shall say unto thee, art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, thus saith the Lord God, in that day, when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it? And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army, and thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land that the heathen may know me, when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. So how is God going to be sanctified before their eyes? When he rains down the fire and brimstone and just destroys all of them. He say, you know what? I'm going to be sanctified in their eyes. They're going to see this and, and again, just know that's why we're trusting in you. Right? Um, it, so, you know, that, that's all I ever, you could finish reading Ezekiel 38 and 39 later and see what you think about that connection, but, um, that's kind of where I, where I was able to stop with, with the connections. I think it makes a lot of sense. To me, to me it seems pretty clear that that's, that's what this is talking about. We know it's talking about uh, future events. I, I just see that last part as being also like the end of, of that millennial reign. I think there's enough evidence there to support that view. And if not, well, probably not going to change anything about the way you live right now. So, <laughs> If you feel different about that, that's your opinion. That's fine. But I think I think there's a lot of cool a lot of cool insight there, and and it's amazing how all the way back in Isaiah they're receiving this information, and then but then how much the New Testament sheds that light on all of these darker sayings. Again, just continuing in my mind to prove this is of God, because nobody could shine so much light on all of these passages and have it fit together so perfectly. I mean, we jump from, you know, Revelation 3, Revelation 5, Revelation 22, Revelation 19, you know, all these different places in that book were covering different parts of Isaiah chapter 11 and other parts of Isaiah as well. But, but it's, it's, it would be too much for, for one person to, to be able to fake it. It's got to be of God. Glory to God. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for preserving your word for us and just for all the amazing insights that we have. Lord, I'm really looking forward to that millennial reign, but we know that we're going to go through tribulation before that day comes. God, I pray that you please strengthen us, help us to be built up and established and grounded in our faith, that we could stand in the, uh, the difficult days and the trying days, Lord, and that we could stand firm unto the end. Please strengthen us, Lord. Help us to, uh, to walk in the Spirit and, 
and not in our flesh, that we could, we could strengthen that, that spiritual walk that we have and that we will um, be able to see that, that glorious day of your coming. And, and if we don't, dear Lord, uh, we're, we're looking forward to be able to uh, come back to this earth and, and be able to rule and reign with you. Lord, help us to be prepared for that day. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.